This is Seafood David A. Ross, and uh, welcome once again to the Lion's Roar. I decided to dedicate this podcast to talking about some um, politics, the the traps that politics lay for people, um, and why Chinese martial arts have so many problems. It has to do with basically politics and personalities. Um, I also wanted to explain, recently I put up a clip, um, uh, Frank Yi Yi Chu Wai Sifu, who is a very well-known um, Hunga teacher who was very good friends with my teacher, um, Chante San, and who was one of the witnesses at my VICE, my formal adoption, um, had a newsletter. And when we did that uh, formal adoption, it was with the opening of the first uh, full-time commercial school. Um, I taught the first public classes, which were in Chinatown, but I was renting dance studio space. I was teaching like two or three times a week. Um, we decided to open um, a full-time school, you know, like a commercial school. And uh, so they said, I do the buy C at the grand opening, and, and that's how it went. And um, the newsletter covered about this. And of course, um, in covering this, it mentioned, um, you know, that person that, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, funny stories about who most people know who I'm going to talk about. Um, and I thought I would explain once again, because, you know, like, assuming that everyone has the same knowledge, you know, that everybody has been around in Chinese martial arts for the last 50 years and knows all the same things, uh, obviously is um, not uh, a good way to a operate. You have to keep re-educating people on the history. Um, we don't have history books. You know, this is the history of Kung Fu in America, and you shall know these things. Um, and the more we put it out, the better it is because people get a perspective. Um, I thought I would go into this because it's instructive, and then I'd go into something else. Um, Everyone knows that I was doing Shui Zhao, and I met Stephen Lorette at the Shui Zhao school. And Stephen Lorette then said, oh, Chante San is back in New York. Would you like to meet him? And I said yes, and uh, we brought Stephen Ventura along, and the rest is history. Um, so we were originally training with him, um, first in the Duk Chan, which is the, the Chan Family Association in New York City's Chinatown, and then um, uh, we, we believe that because he was teaching Americans, he got pushed out. Um, we're not 100% sure, but then he had to move out. He moved back into Brooklyn with his wife, and then we were training with Brooklyn, and like I said, I started the first public classes, which were on Lafayette Street. I was renting space um, by the hour at a place that was called Musical Theater Works, um, and we were teaching, and um, this is at the point at which, you know, we, we gained a lot of people that came from the outside and a lot of the people that later on became figures in Chante San's group. Um, the person who decided to open the commercial school, because they always had wanted to open a commercial school, and I'm going to leave out names, but everybody will know who these people are. I'm just not going to name them. Um, the person that wanted to open this school, who had been training first with me and then started training with Chante San and put together the money, uh, and I helped put together some of the money and gave them a lot of weapons that I had had and everything, um, was also a bit of a kung fu movie fanatic um, to the point which they, they literally kind of believed that kung fu movies were reality, and we kept trying to say to them it's a little different, to the point where I said, you know, at one point they went to Hong Kong and they met with the Lao family, you know, the famous, you know, uh, Shot One Thirty Six Chamber, you know, movie family, and uh, he asked them about something and they were like, but that's a movie. So, you know, for good, bad, or indifferent, but a lot of Americans uh, fell in love with the Kung Fu movies. I love the Kung Fu movies. I just didn't believe they were reality. Um, but it, it kind of predisposed him to sort of make this really bad choice, which we all live to, to have to deal with for, you know, decades later, which was that um, he was fascinated with the idea of monkey kung fu. And of course, now everybody's going to know who I'm talking about, right? Um, so he was led to believe that there was a person in Long Island who knew monkey kung fu and wanted to bring him in so that they could learn monkey kung fu and open a school and he said well of course if you're teaching monkey kung fu and this is the other big mistake the idea that if you teach something cool like out of a kung fu movie that somehow is going to translate to monetary success which it didn't um but wanted to bring this person in so this person was brought in and 
they were brought into the organization. They were brought in very late. Um, later on, they said that they were adopted as a child by Chante San, which is hysterical, because they were 24 when they met Chante San. Um, they also like to talk about training with Chante San before he was in the United States. Um, there are a lot of people that do that, claim, you know, they want to jump up on somebody, so they want to claim, I was training with him back at this time. Well, he was in China at that time. Um, you know, or people in China that claim they trained with him after he left, and he didn't go back. Um, he went back very late in life for, for a very short period of time when he married his second wife. But that's a whole other story that I'm not getting into at this moment. Um, so he was brought into the group, introduced to Chante San, was given an opportunity to learn. He was a traveling salesman. He literally sold steak knives out of the trunk of his car. It's neither here nor there. But he didn't train very often because he was almost always on the road. But he was going to be a partner in this new school because he was going to teach monkey kung fu. And um, the person that was the financial person, the, the majority owner, so to speak, in the school, wanted to bring him in. And it turned out to be a mistake because it turned out not only that he didn't bother to learn Chante San's material, but yet, you know, once he latched on to Chante San, said he did Chante San material. Um, what happened was... Um, if you look on the internet, you'll see uh, a lot of tapes. And this is the other funny thing. This was tapes of us, mostly me actually, walking through forms. And people were like, hey, look how slow they are. It looks like they're walking through it. And the tape starts off with, this is us preserving forms and at walk through pace. But people can't even read. So they can't read the first six seconds of the video where it says we're walking through. So there was all these forms that was taped so that we would preserve the material. And he would go into the office, stick in a VHS tape, watch the, the, the form, and then come out and try to teach it. And even then he you know, messed things up and people know this because they were there. Um, you know, and, and even when he broke away from the original Long Island school and tried to open his own school, it was the same thing. So he was you know, effectively part of Chante San's organization, but he maybe trained with him I'm going to be generous here and say 10 or 15 hours the whole time that he was there. Um, he was not around. And you can look at pictures when Chante San would come down to the Lafayette Street School to train us who was in those pictures. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll stick it up in the – I'm going to make this a public one. So I'm going to stick it up publicly and maybe I'll stick up some pictures of the, the group and you'll see that person is not in those pictures. And when they became very controversial later and said they were training there, I said, well, produce pictures of you in Chinatown. And they couldn't do it because they never trained in Chinatown. They were never there. Um, they trained a little bit at Lafayette, but they have almost no pictures of that because, again, they were almost never there. Um, you know, it is what it is. They were brought in because somebody thought they did monkey. And then I put up a tape so you can go on my YouTube channel and find it, and then you'll know who I'm talking about, obviously. Um, but look at what they're – calling monkey kung fu it's clearly something they're making up as they're going along um you know but this is the unfortunate thing it brought in and it's because you know a lot of people still embrace movies and embrace these false ideas that you know if you do something cool like that it's going to somehow transfer into you know money just like um you know lineage lineage doesn't mean anything um one of the people with some of the one of the best lineages in Tai Chi in this country, when they do demonstrations, is pathetic. And again, you'll know who I'm talking about. It's just not a, a stretch to know this. Um, lineage is not anything. Um, you know, people put, you know, like I'm the 36th, you know, generation inheritor from Shaolin. I used to say to people when I was doing business consulting for martial arts schools, um, apply the so what test, which is that anything that you put out there, anything that you say on a flyer or in a, you know, yellow pages in the old days and if you could say so what 36th generation disciple of Shaolin so what monkey kung fu so what um you know uh anything I mean you know it, it, that these people most people well, most people but think about self-defense but it's hard to say so what to well you want to learn something else um get healthy yes lose some weight yes these are not so what things but kung fu is full of so much so what stuff you know, iron palm and iron body. Uh, so what? I mean, I'm not saying those aren't good training, but um, trying to make a success out of commercial martial arts school is not as easy as I'm going to teach monkey kung fu. And so we got stuck with this person that really shouldn't have had anything to do with the tradition um, because of that. I'm going to move on a little bit. And again, I'm, I'm redacting the names to protect the, the, the guilty. 
I mean, I do that all the time, but it's just, it just makes life simpler. Um, and what's funny is sometimes I put up stuff, I put up something on Facebook, and again, it's redacted. And you know that somebody's going to come on and go like, blah, 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 blah. Well, we didn't name any names. We didn't even name what system they're talking about. If you're responding to it and being defensive about it, what does that say? You, you know it's you, right? It's one of the reasons I do it also, because then, it's, you know, it's, it's self-obvious. You can't come out and go, hey, well, that's, I, that's not true about me. Well, how do you know I was talking about you? I'm not talking about it. So there are a lot of Chinese martial arts systems. There are a lot of very good Chinese martial arts systems. There's a lot of very effective Chinese martial arts systems. Almost none of them are big. I mean, you could say Wing Chun is big because it's a big system. Hung Gai is big. It's a big system. There's a lot of people. But then again, big compared to like, you know, Taekwondo, Judo. Olympic judo, Olympic taekwondo, um, you know, even tai chi, just as an activity. But but again, um, Chinese martial arts are so woefully behind, and you have to ask yourself, well, why are they so woefully behind? And you know, one of the answers is people. People get in the way. Look at a system, right? The teacher dies, and then everybody wants to be the head of the system. And instead of saying, well, let's pick the most knowledgeable person that would be one way of doing it or let's pick you know somebody that can help advance the system because maybe it maybe is not the best fighter um maybe instead it's the you know the, the guy somebody who has some money there's been people that have been chosen to run systems because they had some money and some connections and idea was that they were supposed to promote the system so um maybe that's it but anyways what happens inevitably is everybody wants to be, you know, everybody wants to be the, 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 the chief and nobody wants to be the Indians, right? I think that's the, the old expression. So they start fighting and then what they do is they break up into different organizations. And, you know, my big thing with organizations, I'm not big on organizations, I'm not big on ranking, I'm not big on any of these things, um, is what is the rationale between an organization? I have a blog post even about this. Um, I guess I should repost it at some point. But an organization should serve a purpose and it should be a, a, a you know, a win, what do we call a win-win situation, which is it should be mutually beneficial. Um, I've belonged reluctantly or in one sense forced into um, an organization where, you know, you're forced to do it and the organization exists to make the organization rich and to screw the people in the organization. Well, obviously nobody's going to like that and at some point they're going to break away. Um, if an organization exists just so basically everybody can like have a rubber chicken dinner every once in a while and, you know, hand out plaques. Well, I guess some people like plaques and, you know, uh, mutual admiration societies and that kind of thing. But I've always said, you know, a Chinese martial arts organization should offer activities that support the schools should offer business advice to schools, um, should offer educational materials, should promote the system in general. But people don't do that. They break into all these different styles so that they can promote themselves, you know, to ranks that they never were when their teacher died. Um, you know, I, I was once told that the highest rank in Japanese karate originally was fifth dan, and then of course they made ninth dan. And then, you know, ninth dan no longer became um, good enough, so then it started becoming like 10th and 11th and 12th dan. And, you know, how many, how many dance degrees do you need? I mean, you know, I, I don't like any rank. I, you know, I've been offered rank over and over and over again. I mean, the irony is that recently, um, without getting into that, and right now, you know, I was promoted to a rank because, you know, that was to formally, you know, have me run something. But, but these organizations, they break apart because the teacher dies and then everybody wants to be the chief and nobody wants to be the Indians. Um, organizations, you know, uh, martial arts suffer because a teacher teaches you know a select few so he teaches three people and none of those three people pass on the system so what was the point um i've said before you know having taught more than 30 years i think 33 going on 34 years now that i've been teaching believe it or not um and i've taught hundreds of, if not thousands of people but certainly I've had high level people, people that were, were great fighters, people that were very, and a lot of people that you think are going to stick around and do something with the system don't. And sometimes you find people that you never thought would survive a couple of classes and they stick around forever and learn everything. So I've always said it's better to teach more people because you have a greater chance that somebody will actually go on to do something and, you know, keep your art alive. But um, then what happens is you teach a bunch of people and their own personalities, um, you know, are counterproductive to the growth of Chinese martial arts in general. Um, 
you know, and so I'm picking a certain system, but I'm not going to name it. And I'm not going to name the individuals. One person goes like, well, I don't, I have no interest in teaching. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but I don't want anybody else, my, any of my classmates teaching um, the, the real stuff. Let's hold back the secrets. You know, let, and I'm upset because the other guy is, is you know, going to teach the system, right? Well, how does that advance the system? So what, you wanted to be taught everything and now you just wanted to die with you? How does that advance a system? It doesn't. It's ridiculous. Or another person, you know, starts teaching. And this has happened with a couple of different systems. And, you know, I, I'm going to use Taekwondo as an example, but there's another system where the guy decided to teach Kempo instead. You know, oh, it's easier to teach that stuff. It's, you know, everybody knows what it is. There's, you know, karate schools and, and blah, 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 you know. Um, so I'm not going to teach the Chinese martial arts system that I learned. I'm going to teach, um, you know, Taekwondo. It's easier to make money that way. Well, in one sense, that's your personal choice. That's great. Go on, go on and have the best success for you. But then you're upset that other people are teaching your Chinese martial arts system that you learned. You just decided not to teach it. So why do you care? You know, and then there's the person that took something and mixed it with something, which is okay. I mean, certainly I'm not one to talk about that. I've mixed all kinds of things. But I always feel that you should be honest about it. You know, I mean, I, I jokingly said recently to somebody... And I've said it before, but I, I just said it recently. If you want to check it out, um, you know, uh, you know that um, I steal everything. I don't make up any of this stuff. I steal everything. So, you know, steal it, but but tell people where it came from. And again, if you're taking something, you know, let's say you're doing Wing Chun and you decide to incorporate Taekwondo, that's fine if that's what you decide to do. But don't tell people it's a secret Wing Chun. And, I, and I'm not talking about Wing Chun right now, but I, I use that as a, as a good example so that people could see what I was talking about. Um, so the thing is, they mixed it and they didn't want to say that it was mixed, that they said it was like what they learned. And so then they're upset that other people are teaching it because they're teaching it differently. And then, of course, inevitably in Chinese martial arts systems, and you know, I've sort of touched on it myself, People want a lineage jump. Um, a lot of people came to me when I was running Chad Daesan's public classes. So they were studying with me. Um, and in that case, again, I mean, this is sort of why this happens because there's a sort of a, a good way of, um, of looking at this and a negative way of looking at it, which is that when I was teaching under Chad Daesan's banner and running his per public classes, it was so that he could recruit talent and he didn't want to have to teach people from the ground up all the basics so my job really was to filter people bring them in and prepare them to then study which on they saw so they weren't really lineage jumping in that sense with me um though you know later on they wanted to claim they were my senior so you know that's the negative of it if you said like well yeah i studied which on they saw yeah you did after you studied with me but you know i mean again that's okay because you know they saw did pull people out of those classes and teach them stuff um, and, and I've had similar experiences in other schools training, you know, under the person that was running it 99% of my training, but technically it was under another banner or training a little bit with the big teacher, but training mostly with the students. And that's how Kung Fu kind of has always run. But then, you know, if, if I was teaching Chan Tai San's classes for three years before you ever showed up, obviously you're not my senior, <laughs> you know, um, and, and lineage jumping in other traditions, um, you know, Lama Pai, particularly with Wang Yan Lam, was ridiculous, where people literally, like, you know, didn't want to be associated with their own primary teacher. So they ran around to Wang Yan Lam, who was old and retired and not happy about being retired, and gave him money. And suddenly they became Wang Yan Lam students. And, you know, then the story was that they learned the real stuff from Wang Yan Lam, you know, even though he was basically crippled and blind by the time this happened. So... You know, there's lineage jumping, but this is why more Chinese martial arts don't move forward because, you know, people uh, are, are too obsessed with, um, you know, uh, these petty little things, you know, people want to say like, well, you know, I, I know what he trained. Well, didn't he train 10 or 15 years before you did, you know? I, I used to think of, well, if you weren't in the room, how do you know what happened? Chinese martial arts is full of people that weren't in the room but are experts on what happened in the room. And sometimes it wasn't just that they weren't in the room, weren't in the city. There was a 
different decade. I mean, you know, people talk about stuff that happened in the 70s and the 80s and they didn't start training until the 90s. So what does that tell you, you know? And, and the rumor mill, you know, the, the, the washing woman, the, the laundry woman, the women at the laundry, you know, gossiping and gossiping, gossiping. Gossip is not fact. In fact, most of the time it's just gossip and it's by its nature is, um, you know, not so uh, factual. So, you know, I see these things a lot. And again, I think Chinese martial arts wants to move forward in addition to training, you know, ch changing the way we train. And a big thing about what I do is, is to say, you know, in my books and in my instructionals and in my online programs and stuff, it's not what you train, it's how you train. It's the first thing I say. And then later on, I'll say, you know, like I have this thing like five ways that you should train everything. And if those five ways are in effect, you'll be training effectively. And then later on, you'll find out that you'll train certain things, certain ways, you know, um, and certain things will work and certain things won't work. But in general, I'm not trying to say, you know, by the things I talk about, I'm not necessarily negating a certain system or a certain group of techniques, you know, um, or, or, you know, all Chinese martial arts, certainly not. But we have to train more realistically. So we have to change the way we train, obviously, but we also have to train the way that we think and we operate as groups. You know, everybody's always trying to, people like to act like it's, a, you know, like it's one pie and the bigger your piece of pie, you know, the better. And if somebody has a piece of pie, it's going to take away from your piece of pie. Martial arts really don't work that way. Even in, I mean, I've talked about this again on the business side. What somebody else is doing has very little to do really in a big city. I mean, unless you're in a little, little tiny town. I'm in New York City, you know, another school, even across the street from me, you know, is, is not really an indicator of my success or my failure. People always somehow think that if they're, you know, and they won't admit this consciously, but it's pretty obvious when you see people try to tear people down, especially on the internet, especially when they, they're trolling and they're, you know, uh, anonymous and just being obnoxious. You know, they, they think that it, deep down inside, and they may not even admit it to themselves, but they think that their failure is because of someone else's success. So they need to tear down that success. So that's why everybody that has a big commercial school has seen criticism online. Anybody that's put out a DVD series or put out a book sees criticism. And it's very simple. It's because the people that, you know, I remember once we were having a dispute with the Giant Town organization. And we told them basically like, listen, we just don't want anything to do with you. And they tried to like strong arm us. And they sent some guy down to like, I don't know, like try to convince us. It was kind of stupid. So he showed up with all three of his students. And I'm not being facetious here. The guy had three students. And he walked into our big gym on 17th street and there was like 25 30 people in a class we had like over 200 students and he was trying to tell us how the organization was going to help us be successful and we're like oh and you have three students and we have 200 students you know and i'm sure those guys were like oh you know and that's the, the sellout thing you know they're a sellout because they have a lot of students people should just mind their own business they really should do their own thing Whatever it is you want to do, I mean, if you notice, I can, I'll tell you straight up if you're just, you know, making up stuff and I, and I correct non-factual stuff. But like I said, if you wanted to, if you told me that you were mixing Tai Chi, Wing Chun and, uh, you know, uh, Taekwondo and that's what you were teaching, I'd say, okay, great. I mean, that kind of stuff I don't have issues with. Do whatever it is you want to do. Um, if you want to take Judo and mix it with, you know, um, uh, I, I don't know, um, Goju-Ru. Um, that would be actually a pretty logical thing. But say like you took like Fukuyama's white crane and you mixed it with capoeira. Okay, there, there's a good. People will go, what? But I don't care. That's okay. So don't worry about what I'm doing. And, and don't, you know, we always try to tear each other. It's, it's not a zero-sum game. So you don't need to tear people down. If you're not successful, it's because of you. It has nothing to do with somebody else. And guess what? Even if you somehow tore them down and they sold less books or less DVDs, Whatever it is you think you're going to do, and most of the time you're not going to do it because people are a lot smarter than you take them to be if you're trying to anonymously rip people down on the internet. It's not going to make you successful. You know, uh, kingdoms have fallen and the other kingdom didn't just rise up. It's not like they're on a seesaw. This is the problem. You know, I mean, I, I say this because, in, you know, and again, I'm usually responding to things that are going on around me because I've been talking to people in other systems that are not necessarily related to things that I do or people that would be in what people think of as opposing systems. And we've talked about, you know, mutual projects to basically, you know, 
when the when the water rises, all the boats rise. And that's the theory that I embrace. Not the, uh, you know, crabs in a barrel where every crab that tries to crawl up, another crab pulls them down so nobody ever gets out of the barrel. That's just, it's, it's not going to help anything. It's not going to uh, move anything forward. Chinese martial arts, again, will potentially be great things because we can teach people practical martial arts, good fitness, good body awareness, good health. There's just so many things we could do. Um, the real Chinese martial arts are really a lot like mixed martial arts so we could compete with that market you know um with a with a stronger tradition we can embrace elements that people associate with traditional martial arts that would be good for you know commercial reasons but we're just mired in our own you know like politics and selfishness and and nonsense and uh i, I wanted to give you some examples of this and you know again uh one of them you know we, we got stuck with somebody who never should have been brought into the organization from short-sightedness that you know we had to deal with for decades afterwards and so many people do they live in that kung fu men you know movie mentality which has nothing to do with reality and you know the the people that i'm talking about are real examples of a real organization so once again thank you so much for tuning in for the lion's roar and have a pleasant evening